the biggest problem with change is that we end up going, there's these five people and maybe the outside strategic planner or the outside uh, change, whatever it is that's, that's in this circle. And all these other people have no clue what's about to happen to them. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're doing great today. Uh, I want to welcome my guest, Heather Younger, who is the CEO and founder of Employee Fanatics and the author of The Art of Caring Leadership, How Leading with Heart Uplifts Teams and Organization. Heather, how's it going today? It's going great. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm I'm stoked. I'm just... Uh, there's so much stuff going on in the world, and the world needs more leaders, and it you know, by looking at your background, you've been not only doing this a long time, but approaching it in a way that I think is super relevant for what the world needs right now. So maybe you can tell our listeners a little bit about you and, and how you got to where you are, and then we'll we'll go from there. Yeah, I, I'm one of those, I'm a recovering attorney. So uh, I went to law school, uh, practiced law for a couple of years, hated it, realized that I really liked to build the relationships with people, it was all about the people and not kind of the end outcome of winning cases. Um, I took a long journey of just like working in large account management, doing customer experience work. And I got to a place uh, multiple years ago where I was working in a company that was going through a merger of five companies. I was leading customer experience at the time. And I, I could feel my energy and my mindset go downhill quickly. And I could see everybody else around that happening too, but I knew someone had to be the catalyst. Someone had to do something to take the step forward to change. So I went to the head of HR. I said, listen, there is so much, much mistrust going on right now in this culture. Um, the, the engagement is bad. Just, it's not good. Someone, we need to do something about it. And she goes, you know, you're right. You should go do something about that. And I was like, wait, what, what? I lead customer experience. But it was two lessons I got from that. One is that um, engagement and you know, culture improvement is not just on the shoulders of HR by themselves. So that's one. Uh, it's everybody's responsibility. And that at the same time, someone needed to be the catalyst. Someone needed to be the voices for those who ordinarily don't have voices, who might not have as much authority or title to get things done. And so I chose to be that in that role. So what happened is I brought different people that were in, we were in the Denver office, but there were multiple companies inside that office, even though there were other offices around the world. Um, and so I brought those people together and we started to kind of think about how could we build up the trust? How could we create connections between people who don't know each other and at this point don't trust each other and are actually afraid the other person's going to take the other person's job during this merger? And so we did, we just did a lot of different things to bring people together. And to start breaking down some of those barriers and the barriers and the silos, and we started to really sense a, a change, a shift in that cultural feel. But then the merger itself didn't go very well; it, it wasn't very successful. But during that time, I realized that it was actually I needed to be. The, I was the person. Uh, that's how it became the employee whisper. I, I was the one listening. I was the one responding to what happened. And so then over the years, uh, we cre I created Employee Fanatics. And what we do there is we really help organizations focus on uh, creating a listening strategy, a culture of listening for their organizations. And that, with that, what does that mean? Well, you know, it's not just putting a survey out. It's reading your survey. Oh, you'd be really surprised by that. It'd be reading all the comments in the survey and synthesizing all that down to actionable items and then taking it some steps further and creating focus groups and culture teams and listening sessions and continuing to dive deeper on the data and the metrics that tells a story in the organization. And so that's where we are, right? That is what we do, kind of live and breathe, helping organizations create cultures of listening. So what if... Um... You know, I, I'm sure, I don't know if you've actually encountered this when people say like, let's set up a committee to be able to get some of this feedback, whatever this feedback is. And then the feedback is, well, here's the feedback and it's not good. And like, it doesn't paint a good picture. And then it actually angers somebody. What do you do about that? What do you do if you're the top level manager getting that feedback? And what if you're the lower, for lack of a better word, person who's trying to provide that feedback that might occur as negative? How do you deal with that? Well, I mean, I think in the end, uh, with with any change, you have to have uh, first an awareness that something's going on. And to, unfortunately, many organizations don't. But the ones that come to me have this inkling that they don't have a clue, and they're trying to get to the bottom of it. So, from a from a data perspective, quantitative and qualitative, we try to deliver that data. So, I think with, with the person who's at that lower level manager, you know, supervisory or uh, mid level manager, trying to talk to an executive level person, I think the key is to speak to them in their language. 
Uh, what does this data mean? What does this information mean? Not from an emotional standpoint, because um, the, the folks that are higher ups aren't probably wanting to hear the emotional side necessarily, but I would think letting, telling the story in the way that they understand. So it is data. So we need to deliver the data in the most objective way possible. And we deliver that data, it's up to the leader to take what they can and what they, you know, what, how their brain processes it. They have to, we have to let it stay there and they need to rest in that feedback. So we can't control their response to the feedback. We can only control delivering it to it to them at that point. Yeah, you can. Um, right. And it's right. funny, I wrote that. I wrote data versus feeling like out of the first couple of words because, yeah, sorry to give you just like a big question right away, but. Well, it's true. You know, here's the thing. I, I, this is what I say about employee experience. In the background, it is very process-based. You may have systems and processes that support the experience of the journey for the employee. But in the front end, if you've designed it right, now you're creating positive emotions in the people and it is the emotions that makes them decide whether they wanna stay or go. So even though we don't want to present to the leaders in an emotional way, we want their actions to deliver things that create positive emotions in those who stay and drive the business forward. Now, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's actually, I'd be interested if we go back to that merger example without giving up you know, too much information. What I'd be interested to understand is sort of that data versus feeling the front end, back end is like you have this merger, you have this very specific business objective that you're trying to accomplish. And then at the same time, you have to sort of consider the thoughts, feelings, emotional side. So how do you balance that very practical, I need to get this plan done with the, and I think you and I both would agree that it's the people side you can have a great objective, but the people are not bought in, nothing's going to move. So how do you balance that? I need to get this done versus I need to make sure my people are going to do it. Well, you know, number one, it's not easy. So I'm not going to paint a picture like it is. Number two, with everything, you have to have a plan. So when you think about mergers, if you think about reorgs, right, a part of that plan is how do we uh, keep the, the sense of the people. So how do we get, keep our ears to the grindstone and relate to what the people need? How do we uh, create an environment where they feel like they have buy-in, where they feel like they're going along with us on this journey and something's not happening to them? So it needs to be just like everything else. It needs to be intentional and it needs to be designed. Uh, so you would think about, here's an example. I was, work, I was working in an organization and I wouldn't say they did, they did an amazing job at this, at least not the first round. The second round, they attempted to. I think they got smart on it. So they had. I was in the middle of two reorgs. I was impacted by both. The second time, um, they asked me to be kind of this culture ambassador. So they were smart enough. They were like, okay, for anybody who actually has gone through it or has been impacted, I want to have someone go around, be the voice for the senior leadership team, find out how they're doing, what we can do for them to make it, make it more smooth. That was a smart move a little too late. So it hadn't been done the first round. The second time they asked me, I was impacted both times. They never asked me how I felt. So I think the key is, yes, feelings have a huge part. If, I want, if you want to get buy-in, you need to make sure they feel good about it. It may not be that they agree about every element of it, right? But that they feel like they had a say in it. They got to use their voices. Maybe some tweaks and changes were done because of their voices. We need to listen at every stage. We need to be really intentional about that. Mm. So I guess the flip side is you had alluded to they listened, they listened too late, and then you prefaced it by, it wasn't successful. So tell me that, or as successful as it could have been. So Yeah, and I, th I think in that regard, so as I would go around to all the people, there, was a, there were a lot of broken hearts, a lot of hurt feelings when I went around to all the people related to the change that happened. You know, it's this, it's this thing that's like this balance between having to be hush-hush between the process of like, you know, you got private equity, you got merger, whatever is happening, you're trying to be hush-hush, keep it secret, secret on the low down. Then you go to, to announce it and everyone's like, what, what, what? it's like a jolt. It's like, what? I had no clue this happened to me. No one likes things to happen to them. They want to be in the driver's seat to a certain extent. They want to have a certain level of control. So I think figuring out ahead of time, what, how much control or influence can your team members have on this process? How much do you, this is strategy. How much would you want that you want them to listen in advance of doing this move? Uh, and you know, having, having listening and, and having a an, uh, kind of an action effect, I mean, kind of both of them together. It's not just listening, it's acting upon it. So how much can, are you gonna do that? Are you prepared to do that? And if that's the case, are you setting up the process and designing that experience before you actually set out on that change? Asking yourself that question. How do you get them included in it? Because if you don't, it feels like it's happening to them. They're automatically looking towards the door when it happens because they're like, ah. So I think in that case, again, um, 
what they did is they, they didn't do it way, they didn't plan this way before in the first launch. Um, and then they didn't, they didn't consider, and I think it does require that they put the right people in that role to do that. Doesn't mean HR, it doesn't mean that. It could be just someone who you know is attuned to the, the kind of the, the temperature inside the workplace. Okay, so then that person up front is involved pre merger pre acquisition like pre and they're involved at the very beginning thinking about how does that design look and maybe it's a design thinking and team member someone who they, they already maybe have helped with process changes that are design oriented relate to customer or whatever um that's the other thing is considering the customer what happened in that one in the merger situation they wanted to like they wanted to i'm not going to go too detailed but basically there was a product they wanted to change it into a different type of product like morph it to this to this, they assume the customer won it with, with, with maybe they asked a few customers, but they then didn't provide all of the updates and the needs that the customer needed. It was a tech, it ended up being a tech product in the end. And they didn't provide that fast enough where the client was like, nope, this is not going to work for me. And it just, and then, so then expenses boiled up and then this happened. So it's kind of a whole um, uh, kind of a domino effect that took place because it wasn't designed right. It wasn't thought out well enough in the beginning. So if we, because what I heard, I mean, obviously with the mergers and acquisitions and, and we'll, maybe the term like change management with significant change, because even we, we alluded to, you know, you do virtual presentations, like COVID in itself has been a big, big change. COVID uh, was upon, forced upon us and everybody had to do it. But I think some people might have had mandates they wanted to put in. COVID came, they had to sort of pause the mandates to deal with the urgent. Now that people are starting to get their vaccines, things are starting to open up, they're starting to put back in those other mandates that they have to deal with another level of complexity. So the, the two, two pieces that I really wanted to probe or ask more about was that idea of, okay, how much control or influence do you want your people to have on this process, but then designing the experience. Like how does one even go about designing the experience? I'm a strategic planning guy. I know how to make a strategic plan. If you asked me to design an experience for a change management protocol, I'd be okay at it. But you know, how does a CEO or does a board do that? Does a CEO do that? Does a leadership member do that? Like who runs this thing? Well, I mean, I'd say no, number one, it, it needs to start from the top. Absolutely. So it had the, the, the senior leadership team has to be a part of it. But I would say again, to if you're wanting to really design this, HR is probably not going to, I'm just telling you, you need to have them at the table, but they're probably not the ones who are going to help you with that. I would, I would absolutely go to someone who does design thinking. They may have been design thinking in the customer space. Maybe they do in the employee space. Uh, we obviously do some of that work. The, the issue here is um, you've got to have folks that are you have to have empathy and compassion inserted into the into the process, which is kind of weird because you're taking. I'm telling telling you to be objective. I'm telling you to do data data right, but in order for you to really understand what that journey looks like for people, you have to include them in the process too. So once you start it here, you bring the design thinker in. Now you bring your end user of that experience into the circle too. So now you start to bring different people inside and in, from different areas in your organization to the table to say, you know, uh, th those that you know that you can trust and say these. This is what we're thinking of doing. This is what's happening happening. And I know this is hard because, oh my gosh, hush, hush. This is the hush, hush. We're at the hush, hush phase. <laughs> we can't tell anybody anything. Um, that's a problem because again, you're going to start going down this road. You've gone way too far and you have not injected the voice of your end user. The end user of that merger experience are the customers that you serve and the, the team members that drive that business for that drive the merger forward from the day-to-day -day responsibility. If you have not injected them, your end user voice into that experience, you have just already started off in a bad way. You're going to get you're going to get a lot more uh, friction when you do that. So I would say the number one, sit people around the table and actually physically have like some really long whiteboard and start talking about every step of this journey, writing this out, putting smiley faces. Where what's the current state? What's the current state of that journey? Is it good already? Because you're and you're going to know that not by guessing it, but by asking it. You're going to look at your survey data. You might have some focus groups. You may bring the people to do a round table. But along the way, there's this journey. Okay, so then how is this going to change during this merger or during this acquisition or during the, whatever this is, whatever the change is? We're going to change this whatever process. And it, who is it going to impact? Um, many years ago, I worked at an organization, probably been like 15 years, and they did something called change board. And it was in a FDA environment. So it needed to be very, very tight. Their change process had to be very tight. They had to make sure that everybody who was impacted by the change would be notified of any tweaks or anything in the process so that 
because they needed to, because it was an FDA type of organization. But I loved the model because what would happen is you would put together this change form that would say, okay, here's the reason, here's the, the value it ties to, here's the executive sponsor, it had all that. Here are the, the departments we think are impacted. But now we're going to, we're going to, present this at this change board where every department inside the organization kind of joins either virtually or in person just for like 30 minutes a week. It's not some big, long, drawn out thing. And you present the new change request and you say, okay, here's the five departments we think are covered. And then they say, and then this two other departments say, oh, no, we are too. Oh, no, we're impacted. We need to know that too. So now you just added two more people, two more departments into the process of people that need to be informed about the changes about to take place. Now they all can prepare mentally, systematically, all of those, right? But it, it, it is more inclusive. And I think that's the key is that often what happens, the changes that happen, happen in silos, more exclusive, and it's the wrong place to start. Hmm. What I really took away from that, so to try to synthesize, you know, obviously designing the process, putting it into this like flow and, and mapping it out, like taking time to plan this whole thing versus just like, hey, we have this idea of what we're going to do. Let's run through it because you know, we talk about false starts, we talk about resistance. I mean, the worst thing that could happen is you roll this thing out, you get resistance, and they get stuck, especially if it's a critical measure. Um, I, I do want to go back to that design thinking and incorporating empathy and compassion along with the design thinking. But I, I, what I really like was the sort of step process of that sort of change form, you know, who is it going to impact? Communicate with them, make sure that there's an executive sponsor, so that anybody who have a a problem or an issue or a communication around the change can actually has a, a person who's responsible for it. I like that you tied it into the values and that everybody has like transparency into the process so that you don't rely on your assumptions of saying, this is who it impacts. I'm only going to bring them to the table only to find out that there were two stakeholder groups that were excluded in their eyes. They're going to see it as excluded and, and then it's going to cause more problems. So it really takes a lot of work to be able to 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 do all this. Anything you want to share, add about that? No, I think that's good. And I think when you we were talking about kind of inserting empathy and compassion inside of it. So empathy is sensing the needs of another and compassion is taking action on behalf of another to alleviate their pain or their discontent, right? So in this case, empathy is, we, we build empathy into the process by be, being inclusive like this. So when the two people were in the room or on the phone and said, oh, no, we're not in that, we then sensed that there could be other people, there might be, I'm not perfect as the person who's putting this change request forward, there might be other people who need to have their voices heard and, and, and in fact could quash our change measure if for some reason it was a major thing we overlooked. Hmm. So be because you've done that, that already inserts empathy because it senses there could be other people that need to have their voices in here. So that's already kind of built in, okay? Um, and the same thing, it's compassion because again, now you're saying every week for 10 minutes or whatever it is, we're gonna get on here, talk about any new change requests, go over any changes to existing change requests. So now everybody, this is the action part. This is like taking action to make sure that there's not gonna be any issues. So that already is built into the process because you've planned it, you thought it out. There is something that consistently happens. It's more inclusive, which like I said, I think is probably uh, the, the biggest problem with change is that we end up going, there's these five people and maybe the outside strategic planner or the outside uh, change, whatever, whatever it is that's, that's in this circle. And all these other people have no clue what's about to happen to them. And that's exactly, if we've, any of us on here have been through reorgs and, and mergers, it has felt like it happened to us. Not for us necessarily, particularly because we aren't giving a strong enough why. So we aren't giving the why, setting it up early for why it's needed um, and why and how what that person does, that role, that function connects to the need for this change and how they can help implement it. So we, we just don't do enough job connecting the dots, stating the why, being more inclusive, being clear and designing the process. Hmm. Um. Yeah, I really like the inclusivity and I want to just make a parable that's just like sort of a connection with, with my, in my mind, because you have like the design thinking, which is, you know, planning, it you out. Know. there's the systems thinking, which is making sure that like, or, or the understanding or the approach that there's the interconnectivity between everything, that if you do this, it's going to set off a chain reaction. And you can look at that just from a business perspective. Oh, this is going to happen. This is going to, or a process perspective. But when you add in that empathy and compassion, then you start to, by nature, systems thinking from a people perspective, mm -hmm. not just systems thinking. You're actually like, okay, how is this going to affect Sally in HR? 
because this happened here. How is this going to impact our delivery team that's not in our office? But if you approach systems thinking with a human lens, it sounds like it is able to bridge that. Well, the, the most critical component. Can you speak a little bit to that, like systems thinking and including humans as part of it? Well, I do. I, th I think that we always need to include humans. We have to remember that organizations are legal entities. So like Apple, it's a legal entity. It's the people that are inside of the walls or the ones behind the computer screen are the, cult it's the culture. That's the, cult the culture are the people and their behaviors and how, how they decide to move forward this day or not this day. So any change that we're looking to have, we need to be focusing on um, impacts sentiment, uh, connection to function and vision and why. I mean, there's so many different ways to be looking at it. And we can't have just like me and you, or like we, we need to have so many different types of people at the table to make sure that that system look at the human side of things is all in place. There are a lot of people that they think of, they are, they're like, uh, which we need them. So I'm not, this is not, a, I'm not saying this in any negative way. Oh my gosh, thank, I need people who really are good with spreadsheets and data and uh, procedures, right? Like we need all, I mean, wow, especially when you're going through a merger. You also have to have, because I think this is excluded often, you have to have and respect the voice of the people who are naturally people-focused, um, empathetic, compassionate, uh, listening, uh, sensing types of people. And we often leave them off because they look at, they're like, look at is they're going to stop the process. They're too squishy. They're considering people too much. I, I think that's the wrong way to do it. It's the wrong way to try to go about any kind of change. What about outspoken people? How do they fit in there? Because, you know, sometimes people get tired of outspoken people, but sometimes outspoken people have really damn good ideas and that they, they call it how they see it. Yes, I, I'm going to tell you that I have, um, at, in the workplace, I tend to make friend, really good friends with people who are the opposite of me. So the ones who are the data guys or gals, the ones who are the tech guys or gals, it's because I have an appreciation for their difference. I understand that they, their communication style, what they need to be filled up to feel, to feel like their full selves at work is different from me. And I try to give that to them and I, it gets me what I need. I also give them what they need. So it ends up being a really good collaborative uh, type of situation. So I do think that the outspoken person, the introvert person, which would not be me, but I'm not extreme extrovert either. But the person who really has to process, has to, doesn't want to really speak up all the time, is just, you know, keeps themselves. But boy, when they speak up, wow, there's a power that comes out. So I think we need to have all types, which is why I'm saying inclusive. And I say inclusive, I'm just meaning like in the biggest, broadest way of inclusion. Uh, but right it's now, very inclusive it's of you. not. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. But in this, in this, right, and, you know, in the current framework of most mergers, acquisitions, change, big changes, reorgs. Um, it ends up being very exclusive. Wrong way to go. Wrong way. Yeah. And so, I mean, just for everybody listening, you know, change is coming. Change has been happening to you for the past year and a half, and you just got used to it. It was subtle change. The dust will settle, and then you are going to decide, do we want to keep this change? Do we want to go back? Do we want to double down? Because it's basically exposed holes or opportunities in your organization and in the world. So change is coming, folks. And, and really why we wanted to have Heather share today is because there's so many components to it that you could do fast change. You could do thoughtful change. You could do change that costs a lot of money and doesn't work. You could have change that does cost a lot of money, but it ultimately helps you get to a new level. So really like think about those things. And then Heather, what I'm taking, I mean, as part, obviously, you know, understanding the control and influence, designing the experience, making sure you have the right people in the right roles, which is obvious, but we forget it. And it's not necessarily the HR person. It's the person like the people person bringing empathy and compassion, making sure things don't happen to people, but at the heart of it, at the heart of this successful transition. And so that you can have fanatic employees is to really be able to have them have their voice heard and then deciding, you know, how much of that voice you want, but it's, I guess, the opportunity is yours to squander, I guess, as a, as a leader. Anything you want to share else about that in terms of the process? No, I think it's great. I think it's, uh, that's exactly the, that's the process to me that inserts care into this, into something that's super, uh, you know, complicated. Um, and it just, 
I mean, you think about the fallout on all these major changes. Uh, so when you insert these things we talk about now, you're inserting more care into it. You're more genderly, you're more thoughtful. Uh, and, it, and then it, again, it, it speaks to the people that drive your business forward in a much more effective way. Yeah. And some are positive changes. Like there were, these aren't all like doom and gloom. There's, there's positive, but then there's also negatives, like bad change, positive change. They both impact people differently at different levels in a different time. Uh, Heather, what's a challenge you want to put out to our leaders who are, you know, wanting to start beginning this journey? What do you want to challenge them to, to take one thing you want to challenge them to do? Well, I would say this, uh, you know, in line with where I'm, where my mind has been going uh, to realize that, Empathy and compassion are not the same thing. So that you say, well, I, I get you, I get you. You're having a conversation with someone, you say, I get you. And what I wanna challenge you to do is to say, I get you and I'm with you. So I'm about to go do something to help you, to help alleviate that barrier, to help, to, to help challenge the situation that's in front of you, to help you reframe that circumstance right there. So I'm going to show compassionate leadership. I'm gonna show caring leadership and I'm gonna do it in consistent ways. Awesome. I love that. Yeah. It's not the same. It's like, yeah, you can listen to people, but if you don't give a shit about what they're saying, then it's not going to make a difference at the end of the day. Um, tell people a little bit about your book, uh, where they can get it and a little bit more about you as we, as we finish up here. So the book is called the art of caring leadership. I actually have two books. I'm a two-time author. Uh, this one is the newest just came out April 13th. Um, the art of caring leadership, how leading with heart uplifts, uplifts teams and organizations. And, uh, you can find it of course everywhere. So it's on Amazon and it's everywhere. I have, I do have a website. You can go to caringleadership.co. And on there, it's an, after you read the book, it's a total support system for you, a self-assessment, a community, an academy, uh, coaches that align with all the behaviors. It's, it's pretty amazing. I've created an, like kind of a caring leadership universe. It's all by itself. So welcome. That's awesome. Thank Heather. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you today. Thank you so much for the time. It was, it was really fun. Thank you. Appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest has been Heather Younger, who is the founder and CEO of Employee Fanatics and the two-time author, uh, one of the art of caring leadership, how leading with heart uplifts teams and organizations, as well as the seven intuitive laws of employee uh, loyalty. If you enjoyed today's podcast, be sure to like and subscribe. Be sure to share with your friends, especially ones that are embarking on this change journey. You can reach out to Heather directly, get her book and follow along. Um, And uh, yeah, I just hope you enjoy today and I hope to see you on the next episode.